Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having business with the United States District Court for the Sunday to New York, draw near, give your attention, shall be heard. The Honorable Whitman Knapp presiding. Please be seated. Good afternoon. Just a, a few preliminary observations. In the first place, it's perfectly obvious that what we want ultimately, and as soon as reasonably possible, a decision of the Court of Appeals on these issues, uh, if it could be accomplished without my intervention, that would be a good thing, but it can't. So, uh, to facilitate that, I made a few tentative plans. Obviously, at the end of this hearing, I think we'll be able to do it. At the end of this hearing, I'm either make a ruling uh, sustaining one or more of the counts of the complaint or dismissing uh, the complaint. In the latter event, I have prepared, against that possibility, I have prepared an order which will direct the clerk to dismiss the complaint, but uh, pursuant to the uh, section 62C, of the judiciary law, I'll in, enter an injunction pending uh, the appeal. So then, uh, and I've made certain arrangements, which I'll tell you about in the event that that should be the result. Uh, incidentally, uh, the uh, the Corporation Council, in its original brief, urged me to abstain, uh, and so the case could be tried in the s state court. Uh, at the time she made that request, she hadn't seen uh, the antitrust point, and in light of the antitrust point, I wouldn't be able to do that. But that turns out beneficial rather than harmful because uh, if I should sustain, abstain, uh, you'd have to go to special term, appellate division, God knows how long it would take you to get to the Court of Appeals. Uh, when this case gets to the Court of Appeals, it will obviously, the court will obviously deal first with the federal question and they'll obviously find the federal question valid and entering the injunction 
uh, which will make the state question wholly academic and moot, or I would think it would agree with the Corporation Council uh, that uh, this is a question which should be decided by the New York Court of Appeals and not by nobody else. I can't think of a more intimate state question than the, uh, than the interrelationship between the city and the state. And uh, it seems to me I can't think of anything that a federal court could stay out, should stay out of, if humanly possible. And so I would think if the Court of Appeals does not sustain one of the federal questions, it will certify under New York law, which it can do. I know very well because I got reversed recently on one of those. <laughs> uh, it will certify the question to the court, New York Court of Appeals, and it will be there a good year earlier than it would have gotten there if it uh, had gone up through the, through the uh, thing. Now, the, uh, the plaintiff has submitted some proposed findings of fact, and uh, I think I can, I can uh, perhaps simplify matters by going through some of them. I start out with uh, finding 15 on uh, on pages seven to eight, which they asked me to find if the Hertz law becomes effective, Hertz will be forced to do one of three things if it wishes to continue to do business in New York City. A, rescind the rent rate increases and thereby continue to absorb massive losses. B, raise its rates for everyone, both in-state and out-of-state, renting in the New York area, or raise its rates in other states to recoup, recoup the massive losses experienced in the New York area. Well, I declined to make that finding because it's clearly not so. They can do a number of other things. They can raise their rates in New York State altogether, or they can raise their rates in New York City altogether, or they can find other ways of dealing with the problem. Raising their rates in New York State could conceivably run afoul of a possible interpretation of the statute which would which might be considered to violate the statute by making residents in New York a part of the rate structure, but I can't conceive of the statute being so interpreted. So I reject the finding number 15. Now on page 11, finding 22, No. Yeah. Uh, finding 22, which is an outline of the New York State suit against, uh, brought by the Attorney General and the Corporation Council. That seems to me a wholly accurate statement, but I'm not going to make any finding about it, because the Court of Appeals can read it as well as I do, can, and if they find it inaccurate, I don't want them to be confronted with the question of whether my finding is clearly erroneous or something else. Just, I'll just note that I happen to agree with it, but I'm not making any findings. Now, the plaintiff has a series of proposed uh, conclusions of law. Uh, on two of them, I won't make any findings until I've heard the argument. But with the others, I think I can make findings without argument based on my study of the respective briefs before me. Conclusion number seven, uh, 
try to speak into the microphone. Conclusion number seven, to the extent that Hertz flow effectively forces Hertz to rescind its re recent rental rate increases, it will deprive Hertz of the right to earn a fair return on its investment without compensation <coughs> and thereby affect the unconstitutional taking from Hertz in violation of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment. Well, having rejected the finding of fact that I frequently said, uh, this uh, conclusion of law uh, goes by the board. Well, incidentally, though, I do want to note that the um, plaintiff has cited a very interesting case where Holmes wrote the opinion and Brandeis dissented. I think that must be kind of unique in the annals of justice. But aside from being uh, a 1922 case, and there's been a lot of water under the dam since then, it deals with an actual taking of property, not with a, a regulation. With the count three, finding number eight, my rejecting rejection of the previously noted fact in 15 requires the rejection of this proposed conclusion of law also. Uh, findings 10 and 11 relate to the contract clause and are, eject on, and are rejected because there is nothing in the local law that suggest a retroactive interpretation was intended. As proposed findings 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 deal with due process and, and section 1983. They cite no authority for their support and I will similarly cite no authority in rejecting them. That leaves us with two questions which I find substantial. First, the plaintiff's contention that the local law trespasses on an area preempted by the United States antitrust law, and second, that it ventures into areas preempted by state legislation. Uh, those two questions are substantial, and I request that they be argued separately. First, the antitrust question, plaintiff and then defendant, and then uh, the uh, uh, the state preemption question. And having heard those two arguments, I'll uh, call a short recess and see whether I feel competent to make a decision from the bench. Your Honor, I have at the very last minute a three page um, sir reply, which I would like to present to the court and to my opponent. It's on the antitrust point. Can I see it? Yes, unfortunately. We have been working so much under the gun that I didn't make copies. Is it possible to put what I was going to make them on the way? I can uh, tell the court basically we argue that uh, okay. even if Fisher doesn't apply, we don't think it, it's a per se violation. Okay. So that, that's what it says. And I hope you can keep your argument with it half hour each. Please do. May it please the court. <clears throat> My name is Paul Saunders. I'm counsel for the plaintiff, in this case, the Hertz Corporation. I will address, Your Honor, two principal issues that we have put before the court today. First, I will address Hertz's claim that the local law signed into, uh, signed last Friday by Mayor Dinkins um, violates the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution in that it is preempted by the federal antitrust laws. And second, as Your Honor directed, I will address the claim that the Hertz law is preempted by New York state law. 
And that argument you will address after the, your opponent has finished answering your That's first fine. argument. That's fine. Right. If I may, Your Honor, begin with just a little bit of background. Sometime late last year, the Hertz Corporation uh, concluded that uh, it was suffering massive liability losses in, in the New York region. By liability losses, I mean losses that Hertz incurred due to liability claims made against Hertz by third persons on account of accidents caused by cars that were rented from Hertz. Under the New York State vicarious liability law, automobile owners, and that would include car rental companies, are vicariously liable for any injury caused by their cars to third persons. Even though they were stolen? Even though they're stolen. And that would apply to, to you or me if we, if our car is stolen and then... Uh, yes, Ron. Mm -hmm. it would, it, 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 the law doesn't make a distinction between or among owners of motor vehicles. It simply holds all owners of motor vehicles liable. So, for example, if a Hertz car is rented at the counter, uh, and if the renter then decides to lend the car to his next door neighbor, whose 15-year-old son were to take the car out on a joyride and hit somebody, Hertz would be vicariously liable to that third-party plaintiff. As I said, Your Honor, Hertz realized that in the New York area it was suffering massive liability losses. Uh, in the three-year period from 1988 through 1990, Hertz incurred over $70 million in liability losses due to rentals in the New York area. So Hertz began to try to understand what was causing those losses. What factors would correlate in some way with those losses. And Hertz analyzed a number of different factors based upon all of the available data that it had including such things as the age of the renter and uh, the status of the renter, the length of the rental, uh, all other factors, all the other factors based on information that it had. What Hertz concluded was that the residence of the renter bore a statistically significant correlation to the liability loss. That is, certain renters who lived in certain places had statistically significantly more liability losses or caused significantly, significantly more liability losses than other renters. And after an elaborate and detailed statistical analysis, Hertz concluded not only that residents of the renter correlated with the size of the loss, but that there were different losses attributable to renters who lived in different boroughs of New York City. That is, for example, renters who rent in the New York area but who live in the Bronx, for example, were occasioned or were responsible for losses that were much higher than losses occasioned by renters who lived in Manhattan, for example. And the same was true when one compared uh, Brooklyn and Queens. The same was not true when one looked at the renters from Staten Island. So compared to all of the people who lived in the New York area, uh, uh, I'm sorry, compared to all of the people who rented in the New York area, but who did not live in New York, people who lived in those four boroughs, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan, uh, occasioned statistically significantly higher liability losses. When I say statistically significant, I mean losses that one would, differences that one would not expect to find by chance. 
So Hertz computed the amount of the difference attributable to rentals by residents in those four boroughs when compared with rentals by non-New York City residents who rented in the New York area. And the difference was, with respect to Bronx residents, $56 per day. With respect to Brooklyn residents, $34 per day. These are, these are actual liability loss differences. Queens residents, uh, $15 per day. And Manhattan residents, $3 per day. So on January 2nd of 1992, Hertz announced that it was going to increase its rates, its rental rates, its per day rental rates for residents of those four boroughs by an amount that exactly equaled the difference in the liability loss that Hertz experienced due to rentals by those residents. So, Your Honor, this was a cost-based rate increase of the kind that one would expect any competitive business to do if you had, if certain activities caused you to incur higher losses, and if you were responsible for those losses and you were incurring those costs, you would expect companies to raise their rates, raise their prices to accommodate those losses. So that's what Hertz did. The result of that was that uh, there was uh, significant protest by politicians in New York City, not by renters. Hertz had very few complaints from renters. But members of the city council and the various borough presidents in New York City and the mayor all complained about Hertz's rate increase. They claimed that it was unfair to certain residents of certain boroughs. Now, Your Honor, the loss experience and the difference by, by the borough of residence was dramatic and significant and palpable. Bronx residents, for example, caused more than three times more accidents in Hertz cars than Manhattan residents did. For every dollar of, rent, of rental revenue that Hertz took in from a resident of the Bronx who rented in the New York area, Hertz lost $1.28 in liability losses alone. Nevertheless, members of the New York City Council believe that Hertz's uh, rate increase was unfair because, to quote one city council member, it pitted residents of one borough against residents of another borough, and that was, and that was uh, inimical to New York's image. Hertz, on the other hand, <laughs> believed that unless it was able to raise its rates in a way that, in a way that matched its costs, car rental company being as competitive as it was, Hertz was doomed to continue to lose money or it would be required to raise its rates to make up for its losses in ways that Hertz believed to be unfair, that is, charging certain renters more than they would otherwise have been charged uh, if Hertz had been left alone to price the way it wished. So the New York City Council then passed a law referred to by the City Council as the Hertz Law that prohibited rental car companies from imposing residence-based charges, from taking residents into account in setting their prices. We believed at the time and we believe now that that law was unconstitutional, is unconstitutional, and that's what brings us here today. The mayor signed that law last Friday. It becomes effective when it is filed with the New York State Secretary of State in Albany. We believe, Your Honor, that the, that the Hertz Law is unconstitutional because 
it conflicts with the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution, Article 6, which reads, the Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made pursuant thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. One of those laws is the Sherman Act. The Sherman Act, Your Honor, as Your Honor knows, is the cornerstone upon which the federal antitrust laws uh, are based. And if I may be permitted, Your Honor, simply to, to quote from the words of the United States Supreme Court that are central to our argument today that the <coughs> antitrust laws preempt this local law. The Supreme Court has said on several occasions, and I quote, that antitrust laws in general and the Sherman Act in particular are the Magna Carta of free enterprise. They are as important to the preservation of economic freedom and our free enterprise system as the Bill of Rights is to the protection of our fundamental personal freedoms. And the freedom guaranteed each and every business, no matter how small, is the freedom to compete, to assert with vigor, imagination, devotion, and ingenuity, whatever economic muscle it can muster. This law prohibits car rental companies in New York from competing with each other on the basis of residence-based pricing. They do, in fact, compete with each other today on the basis of residence-based pricing. For example, in New York City, Hertz uh, has a club that it refers to as the Manhattan Preferred Renters Club, which offers discounts to residents of Manhattan. Avis, uh, by the same token, has a club that it refers to as the Winter Rent Control Club that similarly offers discounts to residents of Manhattan. So car rental companies can and do and are expected to compete with each other vigorously on the basis of price and one constituent of that price is residence-based pricing. The Hertz Law prohibits that. We believe that the Hertz Law authorizes or compels private parties to engage in anti-competitive behavior. If the president of Hertz and the president of Avis came together and agreed not to compete with each other on the basis of residence-based pricing, that would be a per se violation of the Sherman Act. They would probably be hauled off in handcuffs if they did that. The Hertz Law compels exactly that. It authorizes or compels private parties to engage in anti-competitive behavior. They are no longer free to compete with each other on the basis of residence-based pricing. Well, didn't you raise a question there when you said authorizes or compels? Yes, sir. If, if it just authorized, then clearly it would be a unconstitutional. I'm sorry? I say if it just authorized and didn't compel, it would clearly be unconstitutional. If it, if it either authorizes or compels, it's unconstitutional, Your Honor. Those words are not mine. Those words are the Supreme Court's. That's good authority. Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> That's why I use them. The, in, a, in a line of cases beginning in 1950, the Supreme Court has struck down state or municipal legislation that conflicted with the policies and principles of the antitrust laws. In particular, beginning in a case called Schwegman, which we cited in our brief, in 1950, the Supreme Court struck down a Louisiana statute that compelled retailers to follow 
certain posted pricing guidelines even though they had not agreed to follow those posted pricing guidelines. Your Honor may recall that there was a time when resale price maintenance was a per se violation of the antitrust laws and then for a period of time Congress in the Miller Tidings Act created an exception to uh, the prohibition against resale price maintenance. And the exception was permitted if states by statute permitted certain kinds of conduct, certain terms to be contained in agreements between retailers and distributors. And the New York statute was the Fell Crawford Act. I'm sorry, Your Honor? The New York statute in following the tidings law was the well, Feld Crawford Act. Yes, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. In Louisiana, the state legislature in Louisiana went beyond the Miller Tidings Act and compelled retailers who did not sign any agreements with distributors to follow the posted guidelines set forth in agreements between distributors and retailers who had signed the agreements. That went beyond uh, what the Miller Tidings Act exemption permitted. The Supreme Court struck that statute down, and it did so because, and I quote, it authorizes or compels private parties to engage in anti-competitive behavior, their words. Uh, now, important to the analysis, Your Honor, is the fact that the, the behavior struck down in the Schwegman case was not the result of an agreement between the retailer and the distributor. What was offensive in the Schwegman case was that the retailer, who had not entered into any agreement with the distributor, was compelled by state legislature, nevertheless uh, was prohibited by the state legislature from competing on the basis of price. That's what was, that's what was offensive about the, the scheme in the Schwegman case. Those words have been repeated by the Supreme Court time and time again, most, most recently in 1987, in the 324 liquor case, which I'm going to come to in a minute, which is one of the principal cases upon which we rely. Now, preemption is the right analysis for a court to apply when one examines competing statutes by competing uh, governmental entities. In this case, we have the federal policy articulated in the Sherman Act that, that uh, uh, compels horizontal competitors to compete, and in particular, to compete on the basis of price. On the other hand, we have a statute, a proposed law, entered, uh, enacted by a municipality, New York City, that on its face prohibits that very kind of competition. There are not very many cases dealing with this subject. It's not, it is not a, uh, hot topic in antitrust circles. There are probably no more than 10 or 12 cases on all levels of dealing with the issue of federal antitrust law preemption of state statutes. But those cases that do deal with the subject are very clear. We have the Schwegman case in the Supreme Court beginning in 1950. The other case, which I'll simply refer to, and we've discussed at great length in our briefs, is the Mid-Cal case. Most recently, the 324 liquor case in the Supreme Court. Now, there's an intervening case which I would like to address because the city addresses it, and we address it also in our main brief and, and, and again in our reply brief. And that is the Fisher case. The Fisher case was a case involving the city of Berkeley's rent control statute. And the, in the Fisher case, the Supreme Court, in an opinion written by Mr. Justice Marshall, upheld the city of Berkeley's rent control statute, which set maximum prices uh, 
for uh, rental apartments in the city of Berkeley, and there was, a, there was a mechanism to enforce the maximum prices in the city of Berkeley. The Supreme Court upheld that statute in the face of a challenge that, uh, that it was preempted by the Sherman Act. What the Supreme Court did in that case, uh, picking up on a dissenting opinion by Mr. Justice Stewart um, in the Rice case, uh, was to define essentially two different types of statutes. On the one hand, there were the types of statutes like the statute in the, in the city of Berkeley case, the Fisher case, which uh, uh, the Supreme Court described as a public restraint on the one hand, and the other type of statute, which the Supreme Court dis also described in the Fisher case, which it described as a hybrid restraint. The difference between a public restraint, which is what the, the rent control statute was, and a hybrid restraint, is precisely this. In a public restraint, the state or the municipality, in effect, sets the price and supervises it. There's no room for maneuver. In the hybrid restraint, the state or the municipality regulates a portion of the competitive behavior of the horizontal competitors, but not all of it, and does not supervise the regulation. The Supreme Court said in the city of, in the city of Berkeley case, the Fisher case, that if a public restraint is involved, then the statute does not run afoul of the Sherman Act so long as there is no other agreement not to compete. Whereas with respect to the hybrid type statute, the Supreme Court said that hybrid statutes uh, are uh, preempted by the Sherman Act uh, whether or not there is any agreement not to compete. That distinction becomes clear when one looks at the 324 liquor case, the most recent case decided by the Supreme Court in this line of cases. In the 324 liquor case, the Supreme Court struck down a New York State statute that required liquor retailers to charge at least 112% of the bottled, of the posted bottle price for liquor. Now that statute, the, now, now that statute was struck down because it, it was preempted by the Sherman Act. There was no agreement between the retailer and anybody else to obey that law. The retailer was simply compelled to obey the law. But notwithstanding the fact that there was no other agreement that ran afoul of the Sherman Act, the statute was struck down because it was a hybrid statute that, that authorized or compelled market participants to engage in anti-competitive behavior, behavior that would be a per se violation of the antitrust laws. Now, the reason why that was a hybrid statute was because the state did not set the price. The wholesalers were free to set any price they wanted to. The only constraint was that the retailers had to charge at least 112% of the price set by the wholesaler, whatever it was. The wholesale price. The wholesale price. Mm -hmm. Whatever that price was, the wholesaler could set the price any way it chose, at any level. The state didn't regulate that price. The state didn't say, we conclude as a matter of state policy that uh, $2.98 for a can of beer is a reasonable price. They didn't, they didn't 
have anything to do with what the actual price was. So the only constraint was that the retailer had to charge at least 112 percent of whatever that price was. That's precisely why it was a hybrid statute. Now, there have, since the 324 liquor case, there have been two other lower court cases which follow precisely the same rationale, which, which hold uh, those kinds of statutes to be preempted by the Sherman Act. For example, in Miller against Headland, decided by the Ninth Circuit a couple of years ago, the Ninth Circuit struck down an Oregon statute that required liquor wholesalers to post and maintain a price for 30 days. You had to post your price, then you had to maintain it for 30 days. It didn't matter what the price was, you could post any price you wanted to post. But once you posted it, you had to maintain it for 30 days. That statute ran afoul of the Sherman Act, precisely because it was a hybrid statute that authorized or compelled behavior that was uh, violative of the antitrust laws. And the, and the most recent case was a case out of the Middle District of Pennsylvania in which a very similar Pennsylvania statute was struck down by the Middle District of Pennsylvania. Now, that brings us to this statute. I think, Your Honor, it's fair to say that what separates us and the city, at least as I read the city's papers, is whether or not this statute is a hybrid statute. I think, and of course Ms. Goodman can speak for herself, but as I read her papers, uh, I think she would concede that if this statute were a hybrid statute, and if, if it wasn't otherwise immunized, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, that it would run afoul of the Sherman Act. Uh, whether she concedes that or not, that I think is the central question. Is this statute a hybrid statute? Does it authorize or compel behavior that co would constitute a per se violation of the antitrust laws? And if so, uh, is it otherwise immunized from scrutiny? Those are the issues, Your Honor. This statute, in, in our view, clearly is a hybrid statute because it meets all of the tests articulated first by Justice Stewart in his dissent in the Rice case and later by uh, Justice Marshall in the Fisher case and is co consistent with all of the other Supreme Court precedent in which state or municipal legislation has been struck down. This statute regulates some, but not all, of the competitive behavior between horizontal competitors in a way that they could not agree to do by themselves. Uh, the city, in its reply brief, maintains that the statute is not a hybrid statute because it was passed by the city alone and because the city alone will enforce it and because the city alone can modify it. But I think, as Your Honor will see, those are not the tests for whether or not a statute is a hybrid statute. If one applies those tests to all of the other cases in which the Supreme Court has struck down state legislation, you will see that those three tests apply. Those three tests are met in each one of those cases. In each case, the statute was passed by the state, it was enforced by the state, and only the state could modify it. Nevertheless, the statutes were struck down because they, again, authorized or compelled behavior that is prohibited by the antitrust laws. Now, the city also says that uh, even if this statute otherwise runs afoul of the antitrust laws, it is saved from invalidity by virtue of the doctrine of state action immunity. The city argues in a footnote that under the doctrine of Parker against Brown, the 1940s case which articulated for the first time the doctrine of state action immunity from the antitrust laws, the city argues that this local law is entitled to Parker v. Brown immunity. It is not, Your Honor. 
First, Parker against Brown immunity does not directly apply to municipalities. Parker against Brown immunity, which as your, your honor will remember, requires that there be a clearly articulated uh, state policy uh, authorizing precisely this kind of statute and that the state foresees when authorizing that statute that the statute may have anti-competitive effects and the state authorizes it nevertheless under the Parker against Brown immunity that is the test this local law could be saved under the doctrine of Parker against Brown only if New York State not New York City but New York State meets the Parker against Brown tests a clearly articulated state policy authorizing precisely this kind of statute knowing that its anti-competitive effects are foreseeable that's clearly not the case here your honor there is no such New York State policy uh, in and the in the um, city relies upon the home rule statute and the home rule part of the New York State Constitution but as your honor knows the Supreme Court has held many many times in among other cases the city of Boulder and the city of Lafayette that home rule statutes are simply not sufficient to meet the Parker against Brown immunity tests finally uh, at least based upon what Miss Goodman said as she handed your honor that short three page brief which I have not seen uh, I conclude from what she said that the city was arguing that even if this statute otherwise ran afoul of of uh, the Schwegman Midcal 324 liquor line of cases uh, and assuming that it's not that it doesn't qualify for Parker against Brown immunity that it does not compel behavior that constitutes a per se violation of the antitrust laws I assume that's the city, position that the city is taking in that brief if that is the position that the city is taking in that brief the city is wrong the statute clearly and unquestionably authorizes or compels behavior that would constitute a per se violation of the Sherman Act this is that this would be a parallel pricing behavior by horizontal competitors uh, that does, that does not under any test that the Supreme Court has, has ever articulated qualify uh, for the rule of reason analysis it is a per se violation of the of the Sherman Act I need only refer your honor to the um, language of the Supreme Court in the Schwegman case 1950 Supreme Court said in that case and I quote when a state compels retailers to follow a parallel price policy it demands private conduct which the Sherman Act forbids so to hear so your honor we say that the Hertz law is preempted by the Sherman Act uh, on the basis of clear and unquestioned and unquestionable Supreme Court precedent and we say therefore that it is unenforceable uh, because of the strictures of the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution thank you your honor Good. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Lorna Goodman, and I represent the City of New York. Um, first, I'd like to apologize to the court and to my opponent for the late service of this short three-page brief. As you will note, it hasn't even been proofread. We really wrote it on the run, and I, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'd just like to start with a few prefatory remarks. Um, Hertz has admitted today once again that its complaint is with the state statute covering vicarious liability not the local law which is at issue in this case but instead of attacking that law 
Hertz has come up with what sounds like a rational, but is really a very bizarre scheme. The purpose of that scheme is to skim the cream of the New York market. Hertz wants to continue to serve the corporate executives, the tourists, and the affluent Manhattanites, uh, which is the cream of their business. They want to stop serving the ordinary citizens of Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens. The scheme is discriminatory. It deprives people of a right simply because of their status. Simply because of their residence, they have to pay a lot more, a lot more, so much more that uh, I really would question if anybody at all is renting from have Hertz. Any, have they a constitutional right to deal with Hertz? Pardon me? Have they any, a constitutional right to deal with Hertz as opposed to Avis or anybody else? No, they don't have a constitutional right to deal with Hertz, but they do have a right to partake of the goods and services offered in this city without discrimination based on their residence. That is what the City Council thought, and it's not just the New York City Council that believes that. The Washington, D.C. City Council, or whoever legislates for Washington, has a very similar law. There's no discrimination allowed in Washington, D.C. based on residence. Uh, we think that the City Council bill is an even-handed, fair, and legitimate bill uh, to deal with a problem which really does offend... Of course, I'm not really concerned people. whether it's fair or not. All I'm concerned with is whether they have the power to do it. Uh, I, 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 will, I will go now to the antitrust law. Mm. Um, we think that the Fisher case, the Supreme Court case, involving the city of Berkeley, which set rent controls, is dispositive of this issue. In Fisher, the government set a price. In this case, we set a price. We set an aspect of a price. We did not set a price, but we set an aspect of a price. There was no concerted action. There was no agreement, as is required under the Sherman Act, and therefore, there is no violation of the Sherman Act. We think Fisher is very, very analogous to the situation here. After all, that was rental property. This is rental property. The cases that uh, uh, Mr. Saunders cite uh, are easily distinguishable, we think. Here, Hertz and Avis set the price, not the government. All the government does is, is tell them that they cannot use one identifying characteristic uh, to base their rate on. They can set any price they wish. Um, there's no concerted action, no agreement, and um, there's no government enforcement of any price. It's as if the government had said you can't base your rentals on race. That could conceivably affect price. Instead, the government said you can't set your rentals, rental rates based on residence. And we think that disposes of the whole case. We don't think you can distinguish Fisher. Um, however, in each of the three cases following Fisher, the price itself was set and maintained by the scheme. Here there's no price which is set or maintained by the scheme. Here there is one factor upon which to set price which they can't use. Um, however, as we point out in this brief, even if their point is taken that this is a hybrid and not a unilateral scheme, we don't believe that the the um, scheme, in effect, meets the per se rules of illegality. And in that connection, I would cite um, Broadcast Music Inc. versus Columbia Broadcasting System, uh, which says that not all interferences with prices is plainly anti-competitive. Um, this is not a statute that is manifestly anti-competitive. It, uh, it does not have a pernicious effect on competition without any redeeming social value. Um, and we believe that uh, even if this court finds that Fisher does not control, that this is not necessarily a per se illegal arrangement. And that's all about the antitrust laws.
What do you say to her argument that if, it, if the statute confined itself to prohibiting uh, fixing price on the basis of race, it would be constitutional? Your Honor, that's not what the statute does. I know. This I'm just asking you why would that, how would that distinguish? It? Well, Your Honor, there are, there are federal and state laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of race. There's a very clear federal policy prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race. In this case, there's a very clear federal policy requiring horizontal competitors to compete on the basis of price. Mm -hmm. Race has nothing to do with this, this analysis. This is, this is a pure and simple price regulation. Mm -hmm. What, what makes it particularly compelling in this case is the fact that in this case there is a statistically significant correlation between residents and an element of cost. And car rental companies can and do compete with each other on the basis of rental-based pricing. There's no federal policy that uh, in remotely could be said to condone such a municipal constraint on the freedom and the ability of horizontal competitors to compete with each other on the basis of price. With respect to the Fisher argument, Your Honor, permit me to read a passage from the treatise of one of the most well-known and well-respected antitrust commentators, Professor Philip Arita of Harvard. Professor Arita, Professor Arita wrote, and I quote, although the court in Fisher thus seemed to hold that an illegal agreement was a prerequisite to preemption, it did not do so, for it readily reaffirmed the preemptions found in Schwegman and Midcow. In those cases, it will be recalled, the states had also acted unilaterally and there were no private agreements. The court squared its apparent requirement of an agreement with those cases by characterizing them as hybrid situations. Here, the key to understanding Fisher and to reconciling it with the earlier cases is to identify the factor that made the earlier preemption notwithstanding non-agreement cases hybrids. This is readily done, says Professor Arita. The Fisher court itself characterized the hybrid cases as ones in which the preempted state laws granted private actors a degree of private regulatory power. Let me pause right there. That is precisely what Ms. Goodman told you this statute does. She said the city doesn't set the price. Hertz and Avis set the price. The actors have a degree of regulatory freedom. Again, I'm quoting from Professor Arita. The vice of the state regime in Midcal was that California, quoting from the Supreme Court, has no direct control over wine prices, and it does not review the reasonableness of the prices set by the wine dealers, i.e., here, the reasonableness of the prices set by Hertz and Avis in competition with each other. By contrast, the presence of genuine public control over rental prices is what saved the Berkeley Ordinance from preemption. Ms. Goodman tells you, Your Honor, that there is no city or state control over prices except one particular aspect of price. And that is precisely and exactly what happened in the cases in which the Supreme Court struck down similar state statutes. Okay, then do you want to go on to your second argument? Yes, Your Honor. Second point. Yes, Your Honor. We argue and contend that this statute is preempted by the New York State Constitution. Let me say, just parenthetically, Your Honor, uh, uh, Ms. Goodman urged in one of her briefs 
that the court should refrain from deciding that issue and should leave that issue to decision by the state courts. There is, of course, a diversity jurisdiction in this case between Hertz and the city defendants. Hertz is, a, is not a New York corporation, Your Honor. That's it's not challenged, I assume, no. diversity jurisdiction. At this point, what? no. At this point, no. Oh. And that brief was written before we, this case was yeah, even I understand. begun. I, I understand. I, I, I'm just, I'm just, I just want to... I'm just remembering that I forgot to deal with his uh, finding the fact that there's over $50,000. I assume that's accepted. All right, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, the New York, the <laughs> doctrine of uh, preemption, state preemption, has several elements to it. It's quite clear that... Uh, local municipalities do not have the power to, under the home, New York State Home Rule statute and the Home Rule portion of the Constitution, do not have the power to write laws that conflict with New York State laws. That, I think, is common ground between us and the city. It is also clear that Municipalities do not have the power to legislate in areas where the state where the state has expressed a clear intent to preempt the field. I think also, Your Honor, that's common ground between us. There's a third aspect, however, of state preemption. And that third aspect occurs where there is no direct conflict between the municipal legislation on the one hand and state legislation on the other hand, and where there has been no clear expression of state intent to occupy the field, as there has not been any clear expression in any state statute to that effect. The third aspect is where the state regime of regulation is so comprehensive that the courts will imply uh, or infer from that comprehensive regulatory scheme an intent to occupy the field. That is precisely what we contend happened here. In New York State, there is a comprehensive, and the words are not mine, the words are the words of the governor when the legislation was proposed, a comprehensive approach to protect consumers of all kinds from the range of actual or potential abuses related to renting a motor vehicle. Uh, and the governor's council said when this regulatory regime was proposed to the legislature that it represented a comprehensive approach to protect renters who rent motor vehicles. Now what the court ought to do, in our view, Your Honor, in order to test whether we are correct in our assertion that this local law is preempted by the New York State regulatory scheme is to look at the kinds of regulation that already exist in the New York State legislation that regulates activities of rental car companies. That legislation is found almost entirely, not quite entirely, but almost entirely in section 396 of the general business law of the state of New York. For example, section Subdivision 2 of Section 396Z relieves the lessee of a, of a rental car of responsibility for the remaining lease installments upon the total loss of a vehicle unless the lease agreement conspicuously discloses on a separate sheet of paper that the lessee shall remain liable in any event. Sections 3 and 4 prohibit the rental car companies from holding authorized drivers liable for damages to the rental vehicle in excess of $100. Uh, 
Subdivision 5 of that statute prohibits rental vehicle companies from agreeing for a charge to waive any claims against an authorized driver for damage to the rental vehicle. Section 6 of that statute sets out the rights and liabilities of the authorized driver for loss to the rental vehicle in cases where the driver is not covered uh, under subdivision 3 or by an insurance policy. Rental vehicle companies are also prohibited from charging the driver more than the actual cost to repair the vehicle. Section 7 prohibits rental car companies from requiring any security or charge for damage to the during the term of the rental agreement. Section 8 requires rental companies uh, to obey certain prescriptions in advertising their prices and prohibits charging additional amounts in addition to advertised prices. Section 9 prohibits rental car companies from collecting damages for losses from authorized drivers unless the company prominently displays the nature and extent of the driver's rights and responsibilities. Subdivision 10 details precisely what the rental car company may charge, may and may not charge for, in addition to the rental rate. So Your Honor can see that almost every aspect of the relationship between the rental car company and the renter is part of the comprehensive scheme of regulation that exists in the New York State statutes. Now to be sure, the New York State statute does not say anything about whether or not rental car companies may include residence-based uh, charges in their fee structure. That's, that is true. But beside the point, because the test is, whether, is not whether or not there is a direct conflict between the state legislation and the local legislation, but rather whether or not the state legislation manifests an intent to occupy the field by articulating a comprehensive scheme of regulation. Some things are regulated and some things are not. And that is equally as consistent with the preemption argument. The fact that some aspects of the relationship are not regulated betrays a state uh, intention that those aspects not be regulated as a part of its comprehensive scheme. The case that we rely, the principal case that we rely upon, Your Honor, is the Albany Area Builders Association case, uh, which we cite in our brief and discuss at great length. Uh, is that the decision by Judge Kay? Yes, Your Honor. That involved mobile parks, mobile, mobile yeah. regulation of uh, mobile homes. Right. We both cite that case, Your Honor, and that I think is probably the leading case in New York State with respect to that issue. So, Your Honor, to summarize, we contend that the Hertz Law is also preempted by the New York State Constitution and the New York State legislation because it is, because it, it runs afoul, uh, it, it purports to legislate in an area in which there is already existing a comprehensive scheme of state regulation. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I will be very brief. We just have three points on this issue. Um, I want to point out that the words of the governor in his memorandum supporting the legislation in which he says this is comprehensive are not the words of the legislature. There's nothing in the legislation itself which suggests that this is to preempt the field in car rentals. The well, it's, cer it's certainly... Uh it doesn't tend to express the words of the legislature. I suppose I could take the governor on the factual finding, whether it's com comprehensive or not. I suppose I could be influenced by what the governor said. Well, I think the more interesting thing would be to ask the governor if when he wrote that message, he had any idea of such a bizarre scheme as Hertz has now enacted. I'm afraid if I asked him that, he'd tell me none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right, sir. Uh, I think the fact is, at the time that statute was passed, uh, no one thought of a scheme such as this. Mm -hmm. As far as we know, um, no such scheme is in effect in any other state or locality. Um, uh, and so when this law passed, this particular evil was not one which um, 
uh, which uh, the legislatures might have been thought to think about, the legislators might have been thinking about. Well, couldn't you argue, or couldn't he argue, you wouldn't argue this way. <laughs> no, he wouldn't. Uh, couldn't he argue that if the legislature, the state legislature, had proposed a scheme which looks comprehensive, I mean, I agree with the governor's description, but supposing I did, couldn't you argue that if that scheme is to be implemented, uh, the, the legislature should do it because maybe uh, this imposes a burden on the rental companies, which the legislature might think if it imposed this burden, it would ease up on some of the others. Well, uh, let me point out one of the burdens that they imposed in this statute, which is very similar to this one. I believe they said that the rental car companies couldn't use credit cards. Uh, couldn't require credit cards for the renting of their cars. That's a very similar burden to the one imposed. Well, that's here. my point. Supposing uh, you went to Albany and argued that this um, this should be imposed on Hertz and all the other companies, and maybe one of the Congress or legislators would say, "Well, we're being kind of hard on them. Let's le let's let up on the re credit card requirement. Let's let them do that if we're going to impose on this on them." That's possible. And w couldn't that be one of the reasons we shouldn't, the city shouldn't tinker with uh, with the with the legislative plan that the state has uh, inaugurated? Th that that is an argument, sir. Hmm. Um, I think the fact that the attorney general joined with the city in its lawsuit against Hertz is some indication of state uh, 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 of um, uh, where the state is headed in this respect. Um, but shouldn't we let them go their own way and not prod them? Um, I, I think that, I think that uh, there's precedent for doing what the city council did here. In the club's case, uh, uh, which is the well, case... You go ahead and make your argument and don't answer mine. That's right. In the club's case, uh, the, which is the case that we principally rely upon, uh, the city human rights law, uh, public law covering public accommodations had a whole laundry list of areas that were to be considered public accommodations. And the city uh, passed a law saying that certain clubs, because of certain factors associated with the way they were operated, were uh, uh, public accommodations and could no longer discriminate against women. And that was challenged, and the Court of Appeals uh, found that uh, that particular scheme was not so comprehensive as to uh, uh, prohibit a locality from, an, uh, 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 from um, enacting yet another uh, area of public accommodation and subsequently the city has enacted a law uh, prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation. It hasn't been challenged. Um, it has been challenged. No, it hasn't. Has it hasn't been challenged as far as I know. No, and it's been on the books for a while now. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that there are good models for uh, doing what the city council has done here. And uh, therefore, we would urge dismissal of this claim as well. What do you say about this last argument? Your Honor, uh, with respect to Ms. Goodman's argument that the state must, must agree uh, that the city statute does not run afoul of the state regulatory scheme because the state joined in a lawsuit in state court uh, uh, opposing Hertz's rate increases. That argument makes my point, Your Honor, <coughs> not the city's. Because that lawsuit was commenced by the state pursuant to the very same state regulation that I cited and it was commenced two months before the city statute was passed. So the state, at least, if one is to draw any conclusion at all from the fact that the state joined in that lawsuit, the state must have believed that its current regulatory scheme dealt with this pricing action. There's only been one pricing action. We haven't done anything else. So, so that argument seems to me, Your Honor, is consistent with the proposition that the state believed that its scheme, its regulatory scheme, was sufficiently comprehensive to deal with this area. But uh, what about Ms. Goodman's argument in response to my argument uh, 
that uh, one the, the state should be allowed to add new restraints if it wants to, and so it could consider whether to withdraw some of its original restraints if it thought it would be fair to. And she answered that with the rooming house case, which is, is that cited in your brief? I don't. Yes, New York State Clubs Association case. It's a court of appeals case that was cited. Your Honor, I think in that case, and I think I think we do mention that in our brief. In that case, both parties conceded that the state legislation did not occupy the field. Hmm. There's no concession here. I see. Well, that's a distinction, at least. Yes, Your Honor. Hmm. Um, that the city statute does not run afoul of the state regulatory scheme because the state said, and I'm not going to re-argue those here, I don't think that's the right forum, unless your honor wishes. But no, 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 I, I, the, obviously you don't have to argue them here. You would disagree with them and you take exceptions to them. And, I do. And, and when you get up to the court of appeals, you're going to tell them how stupid I was. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. But just with, specifically with respect to Proposed finding number 15, I, I, I submit that Your Honor has misunderstood the factual presentation that we submitted that supports that, mm. uh, because we believe that there really are only three alternatives yeah. or combinations of three alternatives. Yeah, well, you're certainly open. That argument is open to you in the Court of Appeal. Yes, Your Honor. And yes, Your Honor. not wasting uh, our time here. Certainly so. No, no. It doesn't bar you from doing it. I didn't want my silence to be taken no, as, as, as waiving any right that I have. It would be fair to... All right. Well, we have to wait around the corridor. You can wander around anywhere you want to go, and I'm ready. I'll call you back. You've been watching an interview with Chief Judge Charles Bryant of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York, part of C-SPAN's expanded coverage of the federal judiciary. Well, uh, Chief Justice, um, no, no, who is it? I should never ask for a name. He used to be Dean of Columbia. He was Chief Justice Stone. Stone. <laughs> Chief Justice Stone used to say of the Second Circuit that they are often in error but never in doubt. Well, I don't come into that c category because I'm still in considerable doubt, but I've got to make a decision. Uh, first, with respect to uh, <coughs> the antitrust. Again, uh, plaintiff has a penchant for citing oddball cases. We already cited one with with um, Oliver Wendell Holmes writing the opinion and Brandeis dissenting, and now he cites one with Marshall writing the opinion and Brennan dissenting. <laughs> uh, Mr. Starr has accurately stated the proposition that what uh, divided him from Miss Goodman is whether uh, is the definition of hybrid, and uh, on that I've come down on Miss Goodman's side. 
it seems to me what the court means when it says hybrid is some kind of a governmental scheme which one way or another allows private people to manipulate prices and that's maybe maybe not the accurate description but that that's in general what it seems to me hybrid means I don't find any case that says that um, regulating an industry in such a way as to eliminate on grounds of public policy or otherwise a factor in fixing a price that can't be used uh, and uh, therefore I conclude that uh, uh, this uh, is not a hybrid, it's just a, a uh, state or city, as Justice Marshall said, it doesn't mean difference with state or city, uh, attempt to, to make a regulation which uh, I've already ruled uh, does not violate any other constitutional inhibition and therefore I couldn't uh, enjoin its enforcement. With respect to the second point, uh, I must make clear what I deem my function is. I, I deem my function is not uh, to uh, figure out how I would decide the case if I were on the Court of Appeals of New York. Uh, or even how I would decide the case if it were before me in special term uh, of New York County. Uh, and it might be uh, that uh, if I were in either of those two capacities, I would uh, go along with the plaintiff, uh, even if I were on the Court of Appeals and the majority of my uh, colleagues uh, went the other way, I might uh, file a dissenting opinion. But uh, my function is to try to predict uh, what I think the Court of Appeals, as now constituted, would do. And that's what impressed me about uh, uh, Judge Kay's opinion in the uh, Albany area building case. I mean, the, the regulation was so, the, 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 the uh, state regulation was so comprehensive uh, that it would have seemed adequate uh, just to say is that so, I mean, so much more comprehensive than the one we're here dealing with, uh, that it would seem adequate just for Judge Kay to say uh, it's so comprehensive that we just can't have anything more in there, and period, stop. But she didn't. She went on to say it equally manifest that TIFL, that was the regulation question, intrudes on the legislative scheme in at least two significant respects. Uh, first, because it, TFL, directs money to be paid into a separate fund, those monies may escape the budgetary process established by the state. Second, it allows towns to evade statutory requirements for budgeting, accounting for revenues and documenting expenditures. Uh, so, and that's, that it seems to me, despite the many uh, statements and various opinions, that you don't have to show that it actually in, 
conflicts with with the with the state. I, it's my feeling that the Court of Appeals recently has come down on, in favor of uh, uh, town sovereignty, so to speak, and it's not likely to um, uh, establish. It's not likely to outlaw this law on that basis. Now, I need say no more because the last thing the New York Court of Appeals needs from me is analysis of their problems. Now, I'll, I'll pass it around. I'll, I'll pa I, I had, I'll just pass around the order I plan to enter and see if anybody has any uh, comments. And I will tell you what I've done on the side to expedite the appeal. Where's the guy's name? Any, any objections to the form of the order? No, Your Honor. Ms. Goodman. Um, one second, Your Honor. I just want to... So, in other words, the Corporation Council may not... Let, let me explain to the court what what the corporation council's role in this is. Once the mayor once the mayor signs the, the law, mm -hmm. it's sent over to the corporation council for um, uh, to um, for certification to uh, to approve it as to form. Mm -hmm. He then sends it back to the city council and they file it in Albany. Right now, it is sitting on his desk. So, as as I understand this order, he must keep this on his desk right. during the pendency of this order. Right. If they don't file an appeal within 24 hours, the order is dissolved. I'm, I suspect they will do that within 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> if they do, we can move at the, uh, at the Court of Appeals to lift the step. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now I will sign that order. And I'll tell you, the, the process for getting an expedited appeal in the Court of Appeals takes about a week ordinarily. But I've spoken to Mr. Scard Lilly, who is the staff attorney, and you you know more about and you you know more about him than I do, I'm sure. <laughs> and he says if the appeal is filed before the yeah, appeal is filed uh, before um, five o'clock, which I assume you will do. Yes, sir. Uh, and tomorrow morning, uh, as soon as the Court of Appeals clerk opens, you file a motion for expedited appeal. He will see you as soon as you've done that and discuss with you uh, the problem of of uh, scheduling. Yes, Your Honor. It, it, I think it should, will come as no surprise to Your Honor and to counsel for the city that we are prepared to <coughs> I would assume so. <laughs> well, I, we didn't hear you. <laughs> I said we are prepared to do that. Huh. So, uh, and uh, I suggest that while uh, speed is uh, essential, also Leisurely consideration is equally essential. <laughs> and uh, 
I don't know. I'm just throwing out an idea, which may be foolish, Professor Scardelli uh, may think is feasible. I would think you could probably uh, stipulate and get the Court of Appeals to so order it that the Court of Appeals will only, in the first instance, consider the federal question. And if it, if it's, if it reverses me on the federal question and ends the case, I mean, I don't know if it ends it, it begins it, <laughs> it'll, it renders moot uh, the uh, state question. And uh, I should think you could probably get an order so ordered that, that the court will only consider the federal question. And if it affirms, will automatically refer this, the state question to the Court of Appeal. Right. I, I guess I would like to think about that, Your Honor, mm. because since we are the appellants, uh, we basically have to win on, we don't have to win on all of the grounds. We, we have to win, win on one. one. Oh, uh, I mean, any federal question. He, he, obviously, yeah. the Court of Appeals would keep to itself all federal questions. But, Your Honor, they would also have to keep the state question. Why would they? Because, because there's jurisdiction in the federal court. There's diversity jurisdiction in the federal court to hear that. Yeah, but they don't have to hear it. They can certify it to the Court they of Appeals. They could ask the court, as I understand the procedure, they could, a they could ask the Court of Appeals for its opinion. Yeah. But then keep jurisdiction. Oh, oh they keep jurisdiction. But right. There's no need of arguing it before I'm with, them. Yes. All I'm trying to do is avoid arguing something before them, right. which, they could which, which everybody hopes they won't decide. Anyway. Needless to say, I'm not a great expert in this area. I'm just making a suggestion. Well, certainly, I want to think about that, sure. Yeah. Enough, but I, that, that may be a good suggestion. Okay. And uh, it's a very uh, challenging subject you presented to me, and I enjoyed doing it. Thank you very much, John. You have been watching arguments in the case of Hertz v. The City of New York. Judge Whitman Knapp upheld the ordinance that prohibits the car rental company from charging different rates in different parts of the city. The company appealed that ruling. The argument is scheduled for May 6th before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, also in New York. This is part of C-SPAN's continuing expanded coverage of the federal judiciary. The district court is one of eight jurisdictions taking part in a three-year experiment allowing cameras in federal courts. Tune to our regular look at the judiciary, America, and the courts this Saturday when we will preview the Supreme Court arguments in an abortion case from Pennsylvania. America and the courts is seen each Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Wednesday, Dr. Antonio Novello, Surgeon General of the United States, is the guest on our Morning Viewer call-in program. Dr. Novello will be on hand to discuss adolescents.